Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday morning Life Life Bible study on the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, it's great to have everybody here, and uh, those of you that will be watching at home, it's uh, later on on the recording. It's great to have you with us. We always begin this Bible study with a time of worship, and uh, we're going to do that this morning. Uh, the hymn that's in front of you on the worship sheet, uh, number 420, Christ the Life of All the Living. Uh, I have that as a, uh, we'll just have the music, and so we're going to have to sing along with it, but I'm assuming that we all know this very well, so it shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> yeah, there's no words on the screen, so you'll have to follow along on your, on your sheet. As soon as I can get it rolling, I will. Continue on. Responsibly reading at the intro. And we do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My mind is so my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow, and my years with sigh. My strength fails because of my iniquity, and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach. Especially to my neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. 
For I hear the whispering of men, terror on every side. As they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. Many times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we enter the time in your son's ministry where he went to the cross, it's hard. We're reading about his suffering and his death, and we know that that is because of our sin, but we should also be very thankful because although he wasted on the cross from grief, although he was the one that had his persecutors and his enemies speak ill against him and attack him, he took our place. He took that from us. Lord God, thank you for the gift of your son. Help us to draw closer and to more deeply understand the suffering, the death, and the resurrection, and what a wonderful gift it is for us today. In order we may uh, better focus on your word, we have these burdens and things and even joys for our heart that we want to lift to you right now, and so we do so. Heavenly Father, we lift to you the MacArthur family who are having problems, who are in need of counseling, in need of understanding, and in need of your love, dear Jesus. Share that with them so they may share that with one another. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, be with Jessica, that your will would be done in her life, especially with this legal matter that is facing her. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, thanksgiving we give that Norma has returned safe and sound. We're thankful that she had a wonderful time away with family. We're thankful that you worked all things behind the scenes so that she avoided the severe weather and uh, that you gave her patience through the delays. And we're thankful for Lanny that he was able to come in and fill in for Norma and also that he graced our presence and we could share Christian fellowship with him. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Lord, we, uh, we lift up all those who are concerned about the Delta variant spreading infection and also questions on vaccinated people and who is and who's not among us. Still our worried hearts, Lord, help us to see you in the, in the right place. That all of these things, vaccines and masking and social distancing are gift from you. You're the power behind it. You're the one that works. Help us to put our trust in you first and for all of us who have been able to have the vaccine and have taken it, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of knowledge that comes from the CDC. Help us to understand true knowledge that always looks back to you as the giver of that knowledge. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you have stopped the severe storms from hitting us and they were able to pass us by, but we lift up those areas of our state that were hit and people that have lost power and had damage. We ask that you would work in their lives to restore all that's lost. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord. prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for Ron that his eyes have been proved, the holes in his retina have healed. We ask that you would continue to grant him good vision so he can fulfill all of his vocational responsibilities. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Lord. our prayer. Heavenly Father, be with those in Midland who suffered damage from that severe storm. Help them to recover. Be with all those that are helping on the scene. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord. prayer. Heavenly Father, be with Karen. Grant her relief from pain in her arm and give them a correct diagnosis as to what the problem is. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord. prayer. Lord, be with David, who had an accident on a four-wheeler. Grant him healing and recovery. Grant his family wisdom in how to plan uh, this upcoming anniversary celebration that they will miss. Uh, grant them grace and healing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord. prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for our live streaming system and how well it works. Uh, thank you for helping us to overcome some of the issues we've had in the past. We just ask that you would enable in the coming Sundays 
the problems that have happened, be they Comcast or live streaming, that they would not stand in the way of your gospel being proclaimed and sent out to those at home that can't be here. And also to those that don't know what goes on here. You're, you're, this live streaming is a great witness to them. We ask that that would continue. And we're thankful for that gift that it has been. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for Karen that she was able to come and pray. Thank you for Norma that she, when she, that she gives of her time playing the organ. And thank you for Linda for all the times that she has been here. Grant Linda uh, that the therapy would help her to recover and restore her to so she can fulfill all of her vocations, including leading us in worship. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with Keith, that the Lord would reveal himself, who he is as Lord and Savior that he would develop a healthy and true relationship with you based on the faith that you grant by the Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, be with me and all those others in our congregation that are in need of healing. Grant that healing to them and patience while we wait. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, be with Franklin Avenue Mission. We ask that the dinner coming up uh, tomorrow would be successful. We ask that uh, you would continue to support the gospel mission there. Uh, that you would be with Pastor Christian and all those who serve. Uh, be with us as we prepare another meal tomorrow. Be with Susan as she helps and all of the other people that have come and been a part of preparing. Thank you for that gift of their time, talents, and treasures. May it all go to your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanksgiving for all the healing that's happened in our life, for faith, for Dallas, and for others. Prayers answered for healing that you have done. Encourage us in that and help us to remember you are a God that answers prayer, even answer in ways that we couldn't expect or even imagine. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Be with all those who are returning to school as schools reopen. Be with the administration as they make rules and suggestions on masking and social distancing. Be with the parents, the teachers, and the students. We ask that, this, that as people go back to school, it would happen safely and that students would be enabled to learn and to grow to be proper citizens. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with all the wildfires that are happening out west in Canada and across the sea over in Greece. Be with those who fight those fires. Enable them to be able to get them under control and put them out. Be with all those who have lost homes and things and even lives to, to these fires. Uh, use your mighty hand to stop this. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Be with all the victims of gun violence here in the city and across the nation. Lord, we ask that you would be a calming influence in this area, that you would squelch all this violence, that you would rip apart the gangs that are senseless violence and killing. Uh, be with the police officers, grant them strength and courage to do their job, grant them the tools and the ability, and uh, be with people that they would speak up for what they see and that the community might gather together and help the police fight this. You're the power behind it, Lord. You can do all things. Please intercede, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord. prayer. These and all those prayers that lay upon our hearts that have been unsaid, deal with them, Lord, according to your good and gracious will. And all God's people respond. Amen. We pray the collect of the dead. Almighty God, grant that in the midst of our failures and weaknesses, we may be restored through the passion and intercession of your only begotten Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Well, we'll start a uh, new session, session eight. And we start a new chapter, Matthew 26. And along with our normal uh, worship sheet, you should have picked up a sheet that has John 12, 1 to 11 on it. That's a... Uh, John's version of what we're going to read in Matthew, and uh, I printed it out separate so we can do a little comparing and contrast as we talk about it. Uh, to begin us off, though, as you turn in your Bibles to Matthew 26, let me put on the screen our uh, recording uh, of this so we can watch that. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. 
Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, <coughs> which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to... I think I went too far there, didn't yeah. I? I did. We may get to that, yeah. I want to see if I can set it up again for next time. Oh, well, we'll worry about it. All right. Let's turn to our Bibles. And instead of having you read that whole section, I want to split it up a little bit piece by piece as we read. So would somebody read in your Bibles uh, Matthew 26, verse 1 to 5? When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, all these things are what we've been studying in Matthew 25. You remember what all those things kind of centered on? Resurrection. Last days, his return and the resurrection, right? We had the uh, parable of the talents. We had the parable of the bridesmaids. And then we had Jesus' description of the last day when he will sit on the throne and shepherd, separate the sheep from the goats. So all of that stuff has been said, and now we understand why, because we're coming up on uh, the end. We're coming up on uh, Jesus heading to Jerusalem and celebrating the Passover. Follows that, we'll hear about his praying in the garden, and after that, uh, he'll be arrested. So, Jesus says, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Two important things are... The Passover is coming. Jesus intends to do what? Crucify. For that, he intends to celebrate Passover. the Passover, which uh, any one of us, if we knew we were going to die, we might just shove that aside. Um, that would be an over. I mean, here he is already thinking about it. In case you thought it all came crashing down to him in the garden, he's thinking about it. It's in the back of his mind that he's going to go die. Uh, but he's going to celebrate the Passover. And what does that tell us about who Jesus is? Did he celebrate the Passover? He's, he's a good Jew. He's compassion. He's a good Jew. That was one of the most important festivals that you would celebrate as a Jew. And he's going to celebrate it. Because Jesus kept 
the law. And it, that was there he is keeping the law. That was the law at the time. Uh, but there's a lot of deeper things, and, and we'll actually get into that uh, in the next study. I don't know if it'll be today or not. We'll talk about the Passover. And he will be delivered up to be crucified. So here he is again, talking to his disciples, telling them what? He's going to die. The Passover, I'm going to be crucified. And we'll see once again, that just goes right over their heads. If they hear it, they can't process it. They can't understand it. They don't want to think about it. And then we have the chief priest and the elders. And they're gathering together at the palace of the high priest to do what? Kill him. I'm not going to kill him yet. They are. We're not going to do it yet. First, they are getting there. And what are they doing? There's the scribes. Well, some, some of the manuscripts say the scribes, but it's the chief priests and uh, the uh, elders. Yeah. And they are doing what? Plotting together. Yeah. Well, yes, you're all correct. That's what they're talking about. But first they have to, why do they need to plot? Why don't they just go in and just arrest him? Because he hasn't really committed a crime. So they're trying to piece together something to make it sound like he's doing something wrong. And it's important that they have a good reason for arresting him. Why? It goes back to what Jesus has come to celebrate. Passover. Passover. And the Passover means the city is going to be filled with other Jews from all over the Roman Empire. Some of them may not exactly be hip on all the things that have gone on in Jesus' life and miracles. Uh, they haven't taken sides yet. We do know what happened on the triumphal entry on Sunday. Were people against Jesus? No, but they thought he was going to take over the Roman right. the Empire. So uh, around this time, if you read John's Gospel just before, um, he kind of lets the people know that he hasn't come to do that, that he's going to, instead of overthrowing the Romans and killing them, he's going to die. And around this time, you have people starting to leave him, but the consensus hasn't come yet. And so what, what are the, what, in their plotting, what have they decided to do? Arrest him. Well, the timing of it. We were arranging the timing. Well, we can't do it at this time because no, no, we got to wait. So they were actually not only coming up with the charges and the case against them, but they had a, the perfect time to do it. Not during the feast. And so, of course, this means Passover. But actually, the feast refers to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would go on seven days after Passover. Because Jews, you would come for to celebrate Passover, then you would remain for six or seven days. It was a continued feast. The big one uh, was on this first day, which was actually when you did Passover. And then the last one, which I think would fall on a Sabbath. But in between, every day you would gather together for a meal. I don't know what was done, but it was a continued thing. So and so you're eating unleavened bread. Go ahead. So the big group would be there all through the Yes. Okay. Yeah, it would be there for a week. And resurrection. Huh? And resurrection. Yeah. I didn't realize that the feast went so long. I didn't yeah. either. Yeah. yeah. Seven days. Yeah. Seven days. It's interesting, isn't it, when you think about it? Yeah. So, when did it happen? When did they end up arresting him? During the feast. Mm -hmm. So, did, did they, did their, what happened to their plotting and their planning? didn't work out. It got superseded by who? God. The Lord, the Father. He had a different setting, a different time. He wanted all this to happen when these witnesses were there and to see it and to be involved in it and to be part of the crowd that calls for Jesus' crucifixion and be part of the crowd that's there and maybe hears a little bit about the resurrection and then uh, 40 days later, the <laughs> crowd is either still there or they've returned for Pentecost. And uh, that's when we have the sermon. And we you know Peter's sermon, but getting a little ahead of ourselves here. That's another book. 
Yeah, it says that they plot it together. Uh, another way to describe that is they're using stealth. They're, uh, it's like the bait and hook. Um, they, they, they're not gonna be honest with people. They're gonna find something that will embroil the people and will draw them in whether it's true or not. And you can kind of see that, and you'll see that uh, I preached about that during uh, Lent. But uh, there, was, there was the reason that would get the Jews upset and there was the reason that would get the Romans upset. And they got both of those things in regards to Jesus. Jesus claimed to be God clearly at the right hand. That's blasphemy, a Jew would wanna kill him. Caesar wouldn't be that uh, concerned about that, but they uh, were able to get him to say that he, uh, he, is, he is Lord and Caesar is not. And uh, so then Rome would be upset. Stealth. Um, who was that that was reading? Al. You want to want to continue on, Al, from six to uh, thirteen? Sure. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, "Why this waste?" For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Jesus is at Bethany. Uh, he's probably there. He's, he's there. He's been there in preparation for the Passover ever since Palm Sunday. Um, Jerusalem wouldn't have room to house everybody in the city, all of the people that had come. So you kind of sleep and hang out wherever you can. So uh, it's been put forward that they might have at times slept in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here it looks like they spent the night or at least part of the evening at this house in Bethany of somebody they know. Simon the leper, who we're not really sure who that is. I don't think he's spoken about anywhere else. And uh, we have an unnamed woman. And what does she do? She oil on his oil on his head. Yeah. And where does she pour it? On his head. Yeah. Remember that. On his head. This is important. And uh, who gets upset? Disciples. All of them, right? They all say something about it. And, and what, what is their problem with this? They could sell it and, and give it the money to the poor. Is that true? Could be. Yeah. Of course, it's it's whose ointment was it? it wasn't theirs. It was the woman's. So they're kind of judging what the woman should and shouldn't have done, right? Does Jesus give them a good reason why she did it? Yes. Why? Preparing for his burial. And it's so important. What does he say? That people are people just going to forget about this? No. no. They'll remember the, what she did. Grab your sheet for John 12. And I, I want to read from uh, verse 1 through verse 8. If somebody wants to do that. Six, go ahead. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with them. And Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. When one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who came out to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 200 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief who was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of, it, of what was put, into it, put in it. Jesus answered, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, 
which we do not always have to meet. Interesting. These sound like the same account, do they not? Yes. yes. But we have some discrepancy here. Let's first look at in, in John's account, wh where was Jesus anointed? On his feet. His feet. And she wiped his feet with her hair. Where does Matthew say Jesus was anointed? His head. Yeah. So we have a decision here, and uh, there's no definitive answer from scripture, but either these are two separate incidents that happened around the same time, or they're the one. And if they're the same one, why does John have a different account than Matthew? And can we reconcile it? I bring this up to you because there are people that would bring this before you to say that you can't trust scripture. Well, in the Gospels, there are always different perspectives. Or yeah. Scene, or maybe different emphasis. Yeah. Keep that in mind. Different perspectives. Each one wrote their gospel for a reason. You have you have instances where all four are pretty similar. They mention mm -hmm. the same thing. If that's the case, know that this is important. If all of them say it in the same way, it's important. Otherwise, um, it wasn't easy to write a gospel. It wasn't like you could sit down at your computer and do it. It took time. It took uh, uh, the, the building of a scroll. So if you wrote it down, it was important. You didn't, didn't just write frivolously, which is why when we look at the gospels, we and we see elements in there, we might want to question why did the gospel writer include it, especially if it seems like it's, you know, there's it's kind of doesn't seem that important. Well, maybe it is. Um, and here we, who do we have as a dinner? John fills us in. Let's say this is the same instance, okay? What, what information does John give us in uh, verse two and three that we don't have in Matthew's account? Martha was serving them. Mm -hmm. And Lazarus was there. And the name, name right. of the person. Thank so you. Lazarus is there. Some people reading John's account would say, oh, they're at Lazarus's house. Is that necessarily the case? No, no but they it, did live in Bethany. Huh? They did live in Bethany. Yeah. But they were at the house of Simon the leper. Yeah. Exactly. So Matthew's not wrong. They could be at Simon the leper's house, but guess who else is there? Lazarus. Because we know Lazarus and Jesus have a pretty close connection, don't they? And what is that connection? When Jesus, Jesus frozen from the dead. And Mary and Martha would have a very close connection with Jesus because they're her, they're her, that was his brother and he rose yeah. from the dead. Yeah. But even before that, they had a close relationship. Yeah. It seems that maybe that was a place where Jesus stopped and visited. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the anointing. Matthew says they anointed Jesus' hair. John says feet. Put those together. How was Jesus anointed? Both yeah. Hair and feet, his whole body. Why does Jesus say that, that he was anointed? What was the reason behind it? She was and in burial, do you anoint just the head or the feet? No. Whole body. John remembers and recalls is the hair. And uh, by the way, anointed. Uh, is, is, is a Greek word, um, and, and in, 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 the, in, in the Israel's past, the ones who were anointed were royal king, uh, the kings, and it was poured on their head. And so this is Jesus clearly being identified as, well, an anointed one, but more than that, he's Son of God. the anointed one, and the anointed one has come not to rule on a throne in Jerusalem, but to save the world, die and, and be buried. He's being anointed for his burial because in that is where we will most clearly see him as the king who has come to save his people. He doesn't reign on a throne. He reigns on a cross and in the tomb and he doesn't stay there. In Matthew's account, who do we have saying, uh, who do we have being upset about the, about the, 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 the cost of the perfume? The disciples. Oh, 
junior point. Right. And in John's account, who is it who is mentioned? Judas. So um, maybe they all said it. I would say more than likely Judas said it, but was he the only one thinking this? No, they were probably they were talking amongst themselves. Judas said it. Maybe they're all kind of saying it to themselves or yeah. thinking it. But the motives of the other disciples, are they necessarily in line with Judas? No. Yeah. No. Judas was they, a they they could have been actually thinking that. We could have taken this money and given it to the poor. Good intentions. But, but Judas has what is Judas' ulterior motives? Get half the money himself. Yeah, he takes half or more. more. And John clues us in a little bit here about who Judas was. So he was ripping them off all along. See. And did Jesus say anything before? No. Did Jesus know what was going on? Yes. yes. We keep that in mind when we want justice right now. Justice comes in its own time, in its own way, doesn't it? Judas. There might, there might be some human nature to play there, too. Karen, let's say we had all been coming here for Bible class, and uh, you pop in one day and you bring rolls and coffee and cake and say, Pastor, here's a little something. I know you like Starbucks coffee. This is for you. So Faith says, well, you know, I, I brought I brought a couple, a couple weeks ago too, and I said, "Well, yeah, Faith, you know, if I would have known, I I would I would brought some coffee. I didn't really like Starbucks. You see what our reaction can be to our selfishness. I I mean, that, that's not the main point, but there's there's almost a point about, hey, wait a minute, we're the disciples, and, and what role are you coming in here? A little jealousy, perhaps, that played there too. I don't know. perhaps. One more thing about Mary. Is it necessary that she knew why she was doing this? No, 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 no. The disciples who hang with him, they don't understand that he has to die. Mary maybe, so maybe not. Could the Lord have moved her for some other reason to annoy him? Mm -hmm. What reason would Mary have to show this level of respect for him? He said it, Rob. Who's Mary? Uh, Lazarus. Sister. Sister. She would be eternally grateful to Jesus for raising Lazarus. And you could see her for that reason wanting to honor him in this way. But Jesus gives us why the Lord's allowing it to happen, why the Father's allowing it to happen. And it's something much deeper. Tom, do you have something? I was going to just say a thank offering on Mary's place. Mm -hmm. uh, Al, can I have you read uh, 14 through 16? Then one of the 12, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he saw an opportunity to betray them. So, how does Matthew connect what happened with the perfume with the actions of Judas? And how does John help us to maybe put together one of Judas's motives for betraying Jesus? Because he got screwed out of some money he was going to rip off. So it's like, well, if I can't get it that way, then I'll get it this way. I'll show him. Yeah. In, in Jesus' that. words, and with Jesus' words being not just directed at Judas, but with everybody who's present, how might Judas have felt at that time, kind of being reprimanded by Jesus? He made me look like a fool, so I'm going to get back at him. Or my, my ulterior motives are close to being discovered that I like to dip into the bag. Mm -hmm. Or anger that I didn't get to dip in. Yeah, there's all kinds of things that could be involved there. Uh, turn back to John 12. Uh, I'm going to read verses 9 to 11. Then a large crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, that being Jesus. 
They had come not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, the one he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests had decided to kill Lazarus also because he was the reason many of the Jews were deserting them and believing in Jesus. Here's a little bit that we didn't get from the Gospel of Matthew. Who else was going to be taken care of? Lazarus. Why? Because he was living proof of Jesus' miracles and what he was capable of. Was John the only gospel that we have that far on? I don't believe so, yeah. I never knew that before. I, I had forgotten that. that. I, again, it's another good Bible study for that. No, man. Yeah. yeah. Who is in charge of life and death? Who has authority over that? Yeah. Uh, what does it mean that Jesus was able to raise Lazarus? And he does pray a little bit to the Father, but he never has says, Father, give me the strength to do this. He just asked that this be a faithful witness to everybody. What does it mean that Jesus had his own authority to raise Lazarus from the dead? He was God himself. He's God. And this might have been some of the talk that was going on. I mean, it doesn't matter. Either way, that he was able to do this would be the talk of the town. Now, obviously, the, the, the scribes and the chief priests, they don't believe he did this by the authority of God. They don't know, but he can't be the Messiah. He came from that hick town in Nazareth, and they've got all their other reasons. Uh, they need to get rid of him, and so Lazarus is standing evidence. Let's get rid of him, too. Kind of sounds like the way our government works in the past, doesn't it? At least that's what X Files talk about. <laughs> Do we know if they did kill Lazarus? We don't know. As far as I know, it, it never says if they were successful with that or not. Um, does it necessarily mean because they plotted it, they would be successful? No. no. Nope. Who's in charge of Lazarus' life now? God. God. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but what is he going to face one day? Death. Death again. He died somehow. Let's turn to our uh, study guide and look at some of the questions there now that we've gone through this. We're asked to read verses 1 through 16, which we did. We're going to look at the attitudes, the words, and the actions of the players uh, that we've encountered in this gospel message. So what was the attitude of Jesus himself during all this? Well, he kind of took it in stride, and he kind of took it in the attitude, all right, these things are going to happen, and everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah. In fact, now this must happen. Right. He all of these things must happen. He was willing to let it happen. Though. Yes. And why is that? How is, what's his relationship to the Father? He's the Son. Mm -hmm. Faithful and obedient. obedient. Yes, faithful and obedient. And that's why his sacrifice serves to make us righteous before God, because he was faithful and obedient in ways that we never ever could be in our life. Yeah, we get credit for that faithfulness and obedience. And he, he did that all through his ministry, all through his life. Uh, but here now, especially as we see what he's facing, uh, ways you and I in his place would never never have been faithful and obedient like he was. What else about it? Actually, he was loving because he was willing to do this. Yep. Um, think about um, what he said to, to the disciples about Mary when they were upset with the perfume. How did what did he what can we garner from how what he said to them about what Mary was doing? He was concerned, and so he was trying to prepare them for what was coming. Did he throw Mary under the bus? Nope. No, he defended her, and more than that, he says, What she has done will be told about her from this time forth because what she done was honorable and it was fulfilling. The plan and will of God, whether she realizes it or not. He lifts her up big time, doesn't he? Should we guard her from this that he doesn't care about the poor? 
No. 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 Looking back to John 12, 6. Um, no, it's not here. Is it here? Yeah, in Matthew. Um, Matthew 11. For you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. So now is the time to anoint me because I'm not going to be around to be anointed for very long. Does that mean that we, we should always withhold things from the poor? No. no. He's speaking to the disciples who are the church, or at least the ones who the church will be built from. And so what is the underlying command for the church here? To help the poor. You'll always have them. There'll be plenty of opportunity. And so by the way, what should you as the church be doing? Ministering to the poor. Not negating, not saying, nope, don't worry about the poor. But something more important is going on here. And is that true? I mean, uh, what we minister to the poor with, where does it come from? God. Does it matter that this, and it was a credible amount of money, 300 denarii was a lot of money. But was that a hit as far as God was concerned? No. He could replace that anytime in any way. Well, plus he knew what was in her heart. Yep. He knew what her female But th this this argument about it being such a waste of money doesn't fly when God provides what is needed for all things at all times and all places, right? That's Jesus. Any other comments on Jesus himself in this passage? I think the setting shows that he was helping me and getting dinner with a lot of other people, several other people. I'm not sure what it says, but you know, it says something about his, he's not just totally withdrawn, but he's all, he's interacting. With other people, even at this important time. Yeah, I think that's a great, great uh, um, observation. If it was you and you knew that was coming, would you be out in public with people? No. I'd be hiding in my little crying closet <laughs> or, you know, hiding away in fear or maybe in prayer. But no, he's out there, he's with people. You think it's going to happen, but I'm not going to. Hideaway. It kind of makes me think about COVID. Yeah. Uh, it's like, hey, you know, we know what's there. We know it can get us. I mean, take some precautions, but live your life. How yeah. important is fellowship to Jesus? Very. Very, very important. Up until the end, he's with people. Good. And he and he likes a good potluck. He does. <laughs> That's over and over again. Can you see? Can you see he was a good Lutheran? He was. Jesus was a great Lutheran. <laughs> he did drink wine. Yeah. Oh, yes. And when he, he when he wasn't drinking wine, he was drinking coffee. <laughs> drinking drinking Manischewitz, grape wine, and coffee. I thought it was Shalom. I like Shalom personally. Uh, how about the chief priests and the elders? What can we gather uh, about their attitude from their words and their actions? I mean, they don't like them because they, people are following him and not looking up to them like they know everything and they're the, all the end all. A little jealousy there? A lot of jealousy. A lot of jealousy. I mean, that's who they are. They, they were, in fact, the chief priests were put there by God to be the religious leaders and rulers. They were the shepherds that were supposed to be guarding the flock and they weren't doing it. As Jesus told them over and over again. Are they being, uh, so they're concerned about Jesus. They honestly don't think he's the Messiah. They are worried about the, the people falling behind a false Messiah because in the past, what's happened? There's been false messiahs that have come and have they been successful with Rome? No. And their, 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 their lack of success doesn't just affect them. Anybody that's around, whether you're involved or not, if you're in the way of a Roman soldier, you're going to die. It's insurrection. We're not going to tolerate it. We're not going to take you to court. We're just going to kill you. They like after their all, lifestyle. Huh? They like the lifestyle then. Yeah, their livelihood is at stake. Yeah. yeah. Well, the power is cracked down. They close the churches or synagogues that meet in there. They don't have a job. Power and control 
And they're outnumbered when the Jews come to Jerusalem. And so they've got to keep a lid on it. They've got extra, um, extra soldiers there, but they're still outnumbered. So any little insurrection, you're going to act right now and take care of business. And after all, these aren't people that are equal on the same level as Rome. They're Jews. They're a conquered people. And in Roman sensibility, their life doesn't mean as much. Better we kill them for they hurt one of us. And that's just the fact of being a, a conquered people and a ruling, a ruling people. So they're concerned about that. Um, are, are the chief priests and elders concerned about actual justice regarding Jesus? Why not? What tells you they're not? Because they're blocking the kill. Plotting. And they're meeting in secret. And they're using stealth and deceit to ensnare him. They're not just going to stand out and say, here's the case we have against him. Yada, yada, yada. Not right away. They're going to take him out. So that tells you their hearts are wicked, wicked and hardened. Anything Jesus says to try to inform them to who he is and why he's come are just going to bounce off those hard hearts of his. At least for right now. They're not going to get it. Anything else about the chief priests and the elders, their attitude from their actions and words? No, just self-preservation. They, they want to keep the status quo. They're, they're just looking out to keep things for themselves. This, this could affect their whole way of thinking, their whole, their whole, that's a whole paradigm shift that they don't want to think about. You should harden their heart. No, 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 no. And they were kind of greedy too. Oh, yeah. Well, self preservation, yeah. That's what they had. Yeah. But yeah. they could lose. Yeah. Rome has allowed them power to rule. They don't want to cash that in, which is why Jesus was a threat. Um, think about who they are. They're the shepherds. They're supposed to encourage people to keep God's law. We know the Pharisees were all about law, and the priests would have been about the law, the Ten Commandments and the other laws. Contrast that with what their plans were with Lazarus. That wasn't keeping the law. The commandments, but it says that they not kill. They were planning on killing Lazarus. You shall not murder. First degree murder. And what were they planning to do to Lazarus? First degree murder. First degree murder. Intentional, plotted, and he's not guilty of anything. He's just being brought back from the death. Which he didn't have any say in that, right? Exactly. They've gone off the deep end on this, haven't they? I haven't. I have thought. Yeah. The chief priests and the elders and, and everybody that's going about plotting. The other thing, too, is, is that Rome was in control. And if they let this insurrection boil and Jesus took over, they're going to lose favor with Rome. And they're dead. They're, they're probably be the first ones to go. Mm -hmm. Tom, I was waiting for you to say it's they are so political, they are politicians. They, <laughs> they are to, they're they are in a, in a negative term of politicians. I was really expecting you to say they are being so negative as politicians to preserve their way of life and their their own life. Exactly, exactly. It, it's it's in the plotting and stuff, it's it's the evil side of politics. Well, yeah, they want us, they want to remain in favor with Rome. Because otherwise they're done. They're we don't, don't like them any more than they, they did Jesus. I don't know that we really know what political leaning the priests were. No. I've heard that possibly they were Sadducees. If that's the case, then they, they really did like Rome. They didn't mind Rome ruling because it was all about power and they didn't believe in the resurrection or any of that supernatural stuff anyway. The Pharisees, if Jesus, if they if Jesus had truly convinced them that he was the Messiah, they would have thrown him behind him because they didn't like Rome. But once again, they're not going to throw in behind a false messiah because everybody's going to die. They weren't zealots. Yeah. No. There were some zealots there. And the zealots actually in, in 40 years will 
lead an uprising in Rome in uh, Jerusalem will be destroyed and a bunch of people will die. But no. And there's the Herodians, remember them, they're floating around. They 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 like the idea that Herod is king. They think that's a good, good and cool thing. And because Rome chose Herod and supported him, they throw their they're, they're favorable to Rome too for his idea. Good. How about Mary of Bethany? What can we say about her attitude, her words, and her actions? Loving and grateful. Yeah. And look at the two possibilities of why she did it. What's the one possibility of why she did it? Well, she was the one when Jesus was visiting at the house. It was Martha who was running around cooking dinner and making sure that the place setting was correct. It was Mary that sat at the foot of Jesus and was more concerned about what he had to offer her in, in the way of biblical truths or, or her spiritual well-being. So you can see that maybe Mary would react in a different way than Martha. But Martha, Martha was serving now, you know, but Mary is the one that anointed the feet. Look ahead a little bit. Uh, no, we don't have to look ahead. No, never mind. We already talked about that. Yeah, that's a good point, I think, on Mary. Um, and let's look at the two possibilities. We said that either she knew what she was doing and she and she accepted and knew that she was he was going to go to the cross, or she didn't. She's doing it out of love because Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, either way, what does that tell us about who she is? Well, she believed that in Jesus, first of all, she believed that he was indeed the Son of God. But she and 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 what about her her offering? Because Let's let's assume that it's not 100 percent clear, but let's assume that that nard was hers, and we know that it was expensive. And she's willing to give what kind of an offering to Jesus? It's 100 percent. Exp very expensive, because in her mind, he is worthy of that plus more. Either way, and so she, she's showing love for Jesus. Compare her actions to um, the disciples. Disciples weren't thinking. Oh, she brought it. Are they, are they showing a lot of love for Jesus? No. No. Maybe a little chauvinistic. Oh, they were probably a little jealous. Should they have clued in on what Jesus, I mean, Jesus explains why she's doing it. He once again gives a witness of his, his death. And before that, we know Jesus said the Passover is coming. And after the Passover, I'm going to Be gone. die. So he's, they should have been hip to it, but they're not. She was perhaps better tuned into what was going on than the guys were. Yeah. And once again, even if she didn't understand about the death thing, well, afterwards, after Jesus said it, maybe. But nonetheless, she's showing love for him, for who he is and what he's done, that the disciples aren't, don't seem to be that hip about. They're not thinking about that at all. So let's talk about uh, the disciples. What can we gather from uh, what their actions and what they say? Kind of become complacent and not really listening. Assuming that they met what they said, all except for Judas, about uh, what could be done with the money, what does that tell us? That they were giving, and that they, they had a realization of what they should be doing. They, had, they, they, they obviously believed in ministry, right? Ministering right. to the poor and the sick. Who, uh, who should they have been looking to for guidance on this from the beginning? Christ. Yeah. Jesus is allowing this to happen. And by them speaking up and saying things, what are they kind of doing? Jesus. 
This shouldn't be happening. I don't know why you're letting this happen, but don't you realize there could be better use for this? I mean, does would Jesus have opportunity? Could he have stopped it from happening if it was wrong? Yeah, yeah. he could have said something at the very beginning. Put your perfume away, Mary. Give it to Judas. <laughs> and it wasn't the first time that Jesus had to do this with the disciples. Remember the little children? Let the, let, wait a minute, guys. Let the children come here. Wait a minute, guys. Let Mary do what she's doing. So he's had a pattern of sometimes having to step in. The disciples were kind of stuck on stupid all the way. <laughs> You've Tom? been hanging out with Gary. Can you fix stupid, Tom? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Jill, when you watch this, let Gary know that we quoted him. <laughs> but they were, and it wasn't really, their eyes were not open to the ascension. And then all of a sudden, it became real obvious. Yeah, they were scared to death after exactly. his death. They were exactly. hiding out in the room. And they, they, it's not that they doubted. It was that they had a doubting mindset. In other words, they knew that things were going to happen in, in, a, in, a, in a way, but they, they always had that idea in the back of their mind, well, maybe this is going to go a different direction. They repeatedly again and again, and think back to Peter when uh, Jesus, first time he tells them that he's going to go to Jerusalem, he'll suffer and die at the cross. Peter uh -huh. says, Lord, this shouldn't happen. And Jesus has to call him Satan to get behind me. So from the beginning, uh, what the disciples like to do in relation to Jesus' ministry? Protect him. Protect him and call the shots, right? Yeah. Tell him what's supposed to happen. They get off on this tangent, and, and that tells you they really don't see Jesus in the right light, do they? No. Well, Jesus, we'll follow you, and you have a lot of smart things to say, but you're wrong on this. Look, this is not the way it's supposed to happen, okay? Maybe you're tired. Maybe you've got too involved. Maybe you like oil pouring over your head. But this ain't right, and, and we have to tell you that. And, uh, well, thank God we're not like that, are we? <laughs> <laughs> Nope. Yes, we are. We are. Things happen, and Jesus, this is not how it's supposed to happen. Right now, by the way, this prayer that I had, right now is the time. Can't you see all the doors are open? It's now, and you're not doing it. I lived that. When I first understood that I was going to seminary, it was right now. And it was a good year and a half before actually everything came together. But I'm always, it's like right now. Fall, fall term is starting, Lord. Now's the time. I sure don't want to be at Hiller's anymore, uh, but I stayed there for at least another year before it was time. Because as I look back, it wasn't quite time yet. It's a hard thing, Tom. Well, I think I pointed this out maybe some weeks ago. I'm either here or in the evening. It doesn't make any difference, but I don't want to repeat it. How often... When we have our prayers, we're always asking God to bless us for a certain way. But we should be asking God to put us in situations to do the things that he blesses. And I think the disciples kind of got that just two rounds ago. And we are guilty of it because we do it all the time. Well, we need a new stereo system or we need a new video system. Yeah, okay, God, you know, step in and take care of it for us. Yep. I need a new car and it needs to be this car right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not transportation, it's Lamborghini, right? <laughs> no, it's a new airplane. <laughs> Maybe one of the biggest ones, and I'm guilty of this too, is Jesus, here's what I'm going to do today. Follow me. Exactly. And uh, I, I struggle with him having control over my schedule because I, I have a schedule. And when it gets preempted, um, depending on what it is, it can also, it can sometimes almost freeze me uh, because things aren't going as I said in my mind, things are going to go in that morning. And um, he is, he, everything I have, my time, talents, and treasures, my time. So my schedule is an open book. And I got to remember that he can write and cancel and move anything around that he wants in that day. 
and I need to put on my big boy panties and just <laughs> deal with it. My mom used to point out something to me every once in a while. And I, I think it may be based on problem. I'm hoping on that. The woman will help you out with that. All right, you help me out on that. Norma can. Man will plan, but God blends. Sounds like it would be a good proverb. Yeah. Uh, was it man? Man supposes and God disposes. There's something. It's it's like that though. Man proposes. Man puts forth, but God makes it happen. Yeah. We can suggest a lot of things, but if, if it's not part of God's will, suggest all you want. It ain't gonna happen. He, he may sit back and chuckle. I'm sure he does. <laughs> I'm sure he does. He laughs at me sometimes. I can tell you. <laughs> All right. Last but not least, Judas. Let's talk about Judas, his attitudes, words, and actions. We put forth one thing. Well, what did he do? Jesus went from the, the room with Mary and Jesus being anointed to where'd he go? Chief priest. Become a traitor. Yeah. yeah. So he didn't betray Jesus right at that moment, but what did he do? He, was he set him up to be betrayed. Yeah. He, he laid the groundwork. And one of the things he asked, what does he ask them? What they're going to pay. How much will you give me <laughs> if I deliver it over to him? And, uh, the amount is 30 pieces of silver. Does anybody, this is an extra credit question. Anybody know what, why that amount is necessary? Because it's there in Matthew's gospel. So this is another one of those things. Think about who Matthew is though. Who's Matthew? Tax, tax, tax collector, a money guy. So he's going to connect with it. But but does anybody know how important, why, how would that be important? One of the important. Your sermon. I did. And I forgot. So it's been around lunch. But you talked about the 30 pieces before. And I'm sorry, I forgot. Al, you're going to hell. You Al's, you Al's going to hell. I'm sorry. He He's got to tell us again. He's got to tell us. Again. I'm sorry. It was, it was the price of a slave. There you go. There the, price the, of slave. the price of a slave. Yes. So what does that tell you with Judas? We don't have him asking for more, do we? So you, you got to wonder, was the motive strictly, well, I want to get more money out of this? Because that could be one of the motives. He didn't get the money for the perfume, so he's going to get it out of Jesus' flesh, right? Except 30 pieces of silver was nowhere near equal to what he would have got with a nard. Now, maybe he was so greedy that didn't matter. But, you know, we don't really know in Scripture exactly why Judas did it. It could have been part of it. Um, I put forward another uh, an interesting thing. And, uh, in the Old Testament that there's going to be uh, there is. Let's look at uh, Deuteronomy. Let's see if I can find it. This is it. Somebody want to read Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 5 is on the screen there. If a pot prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign of, or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder that it tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. One more. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he is taught rebellion against the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. You have a prophet or somebody else that seems to be supernaturally 
revealing things. He's doing signs or wonders and they come to pass. But what else is he doing? Verse 2. Let us go after other gods. So you know that this guy is not from the Lord God. If he's a prophet of the Lord God and he does these signs and wonders, he should use them to point back to God. the Lord God. Don't listen to his words. The Lord is allowing this to test you. What are you supposed to do? Verse 5. Put him to death. Jesus is doing signs and wonders. If for some reason Judas doesn't think that he's doing it to honor the Lord God. And by the way, there's a lot of other people in uh, the chief priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees don't think he's legit. They're not really sure how he's doing these wonders, but they don't believe that he's doing them with the power of the Lord God. And so what should you do? Put him to death. So in a sense, they're following the law. Yeah. Except it's Judas being an upright law follower. No. No. Doesn't say anything about getting 30 pieces of silver for him, does it? No. But it's possible. Perhaps Judas is bought into that and believes it. Think back to what happened with the, in, in that room with the anointing. Judas doesn't understand it. What could he think about Jesus? What maybe in his mind was going on here? If he's not the Lord God, should he be anointed like that? No. If he's not legit? And maybe he's afraid that he's going to become the savior that the Romans are worried about, like take over and kill all the Romans. It could be a sign in his head that this needs to stop. Remember, he doesn't understand, neither do any of the disciples, about the why Jesus has to die and rise again. Maybe he at least got the die part. They're going, yeah, maybe you should die. Now, that's another avenue for to explain why Jesus did. There's a third one, and, and all of this is circumstantial stuff from Scripture. So I, like I'm telling you, we don't know. It's not explained to us what was going on in his head. But the other thing that's been put forward is uh, it goes along the lines of what the disciples and many other people believe Jesus had come to be the Messiah who was going to rule on a throne. And everybody's excited about that on Palm Sunday. And as the week plays out, is Jesus taking the throne? No. Is he ruling? No. Does it seem like he's going to? No. Is he doing anything, beating up any Romans or anything? No. And so it's been conjectured that possibly Judas thought this would instigate him. This would move him to finally rise up. When Judas is betrayed and the soldiers come in the garden to arrest him, that's the point where he says, enough! <laughs> Wipes them all out and doesn't stop there. You know, heads back into Jerusalem, <laughs> gets on that throne, and now we have the kingdom of David resurrected again. We don't know. Any one of those things or any mixture of those things, bottom line was, was Judas acting outside of God's will? Yes. Well, in a way, I'm going to no. say no. no. Not that God, and, and we'll, we'll look at this uh, during when we get to the Lord's Supper, but he was fulfilling God's will even though he was doing an evil thing. It, it was a sin. He was sinning at something he never should have done but here you see God using somebody's evil plans and sinful plans and wrong things to fulfill God's will. Because Jesus must die. die. And if not only that, he must be betrayed. Because that's part of what Jesus has been telling us. And you look back into Isaiah, Isaiah talks about the suffering servant being betrayed. So it's not just what Jesus has said, although we know that whatever Jesus says, he's God. It's got to be fulfilled. But the Old Testament talks about the suffering servant being betrayed. So that must happen. Good. Anything else you want to tell us say about Judas? Within the group of disciples, he was trusted. 
mm -hmm. because he was in charge of the money at that time. So he had some sort of status. Yeah. Yeah. They 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 didn't. So John is telling us this about Judas and about his dipping in the money bag, and that's kind of after the fact. I don't think any of them knew it. Jesus knew it, but I don't think any of them knew it beforehand. But they knew he was in charge of it. And, and so nobody ever questioned him on that. And uh, looking a little bit ahead to what we'll talk about next time, when Judas gets up and leaves the Lord's Supper table, there's that little interchange where Jesus, that, you know, Jesus has said, one of you will betray me. Well, who is it, Jesus? The one who dips the bread into my cup, and that's Judas, and nobody notices it. And then Judas gets up and leaves. And do any of them suspect Jesus? We find out that they think he's gone to pay for something, pay for the feast. He's the guy that takes care of the money. Nobody suspects that anything that Judas is doing is untold or evil. Not till after the fact. And so, yeah, they they trust they trust him. One final thing before we leave, I know we're coming up on the end, but uh, let's, I want to talk a little bit about question two. Mary showed great love for Jesus by her costly gift. What could you do this week for Jesus or for one of his brothers or sisters that would show Jesus kind of love? This is something you don't need to necessarily say out loud, but are some things cooking in your brain? Sometimes you see somebody that's hungry that you could meet them. Cook the food or serve the food for Franklin Ammunition. And you can you don't have to do it just on the week. It's our turn. It can be any week. Yeah. Ministry outside the church. What about here amongst us in this place? So love and concern for our own life. Just those we like? No. no. How about those that we have a hard time tolerating? Yes. How about those that uh, constantly nag and whine and complain about things? Yes. Yeah, we still have to be nice to them. Not just nice, but a loving thing would be to sit with them, listen. It's always a good thing if somebody's got a complaint, it's a good good for them to get it all out. And once they get it out, maybe they'll realize some things. A lot of times people will realize on their own after they get it out that they really don't have a basis for what they say. When you say it all, when it's up here, it's this amorphous undefined blob that rules over your whole life and when you have to talk about it it's got to be condensed down into this thing called words and it comes out and one of the realizations is it's not covering my whole life it's just this it's and not as, as I, bad as we thought and as i talk about it maybe i'll even come to the realization you know that doesn't quite sound right when i put it <laughs> in the words that doesn't sound like somebody who i profess to be as a christian and sometimes we don't know what's going on in someone's life outside of what we see here. Yep. And that affects your personality and how you're going to react to things. And you sometimes realize that is really important. Yep. When we hear somebody gossiping about somebody else, there's a couple things we can do. We can do what? Um, to stop um, to go it. to the person that. I don't really think I should be hearing this. I think you should go talk to this person about it. And we don't just stop there. This person that is possibly being raked over the coals and trashed, what are we supposed to do for them? Stick up for them. Defend them, not lie. But even go so far as to say, you know, we, as you said, Faith, maybe we don't really understand what's going on in this person's life that they're doing this. <clears throat> Well, they may not realize they're acting in a manner that's not cohesive. And realize because that they've never been taught how to behave correctly. I mean, it's that way down at the Franklin Avenue Mission with yeah. a lot of these people. They think it's, it's generational and they haven't learned how to manage their money and how to do things. So you have to just take care of their needs and hopefully teach them how to. 
take care of themselves in a better manner. We are to have the same love and compassion that grace as Christ has. And uh, no, none of us are perfect. So think about all of all the ways that the Lord has to put up with us in our imperfections and our sins and the way that we don't treat each other as we should. And we've got our brother and sister in front of us doing the same thing. We need to remember that they're by the grace of God. Well, I, I am not immune from this. Maybe I'm not doing exactly what they're doing, but I'm as guilty of this as they are. And I've been forgiven and I need to forgive them. Our sins may not be the same as someone else's sins, but we're all sinners. They're all just as bad, aren't they, Faith? Yeah. Lord, help me. Lord, help me to forgive this person. And a good prayer to pray as they're there talking to you and before and after. Any final comments? Getting interesting, isn't it? Uh, I talked to you before about how life lights laid out. Day two is big. Day two, we've got the Lord's Supper and the prayer in the garden, which I think could have been two different days, but then I'm not the one planning it all out. So it'll probably take us maybe two sessions to get through the next one, but it'll be good. Um, we'll also dive into, uh, in that day two, our uh, enrichment guide, the enrichment magazine. If you have those at home, bring them. If not, I have some extra copies here, and I will be able to put it on the screen. We'll, we'll read through that. We're going to look at, uh, there's an article in there about the Lord's Supper and one about uh, prayer, I believe. So we'll read through those as well. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, speak into our hearts. Help us to see and hold up what Mary did for you, the unselfishness and the love that she showed you. Maybe she knew, maybe she didn't. If she didn't realize the reason for what she's doing and, and that kind of a costly gift, what does that speak about her love for her? We should have that love for you. Being willing to give our time and talents and treasures, especially when we can't see the end and we're not sure that we will see the end or the fruit of it. If it's your mission and your will, it doesn't matter if we see it, Lord, it'll, it'll bring fruit. That's what you do. Give us more willing and giving hearts with our time, talents, and treasures. Be it our time and our schedule or our talents and where and how we use them or our treasures. Bring us back together again next week, Lord, to continue hearing about your life and your suffering and your death. And just rejoice in the fact that you are willing to be such a loving and giving God that we can know no matter how bad we let you down, we are completely forgiven. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thank Have a blessed day. Some of you, I'll see you here live in the fellowship hall tonight or possibly on Zoom.